Hey, how's everybody doing? It's Brother Phil here. I'd like to welcome you all to the Prophecy Zone. Uh, so uh, I did an interview with Jeffrey Grinder earlier today, and um, he's from Now the End Begins. Excellent website. Go check it out, www.nowtheendbegins. So I'm going to go ahead and play that uh, interview. Enjoy. Yeah, because I didn't want to accidentally uh, introduce you at Ike and they, they talk about um, this is my first uh, interview of about 10, 6, about 10, 12, how long ago was that? About 10, 12 years ago? About 10 years ago, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about Bible prophecy. He, he owns a, a website called Now the End Begins and um, it's awesome. Go check it out. Um, it's got to keep you up Today, with uh, what God is doing in this world, as far as um, current events, um, this brother's been doing it for a long time, and I you know, appreciate him coming on. I'm kind of nervous my own self because <laughs> I feel like I'm interviewing a legend. Uh, I saw you on a few videos, man. They they go to your site and they they talk about uh, they go to your, your site as you reference. That's why I'm coming on. I'm kind of nervous. God is doing it anyway. I feel like I'm so yeah. interviewing a legend. And uh, uh, so I, I just want to talk about that for a second. One of the reasons, you know, that I'm so excited about where God is bringing us in 2020 is because I always wanted to be, now the end begins, to be a, a resource site for pastors, for preachers, for evangelists, um, because it's a, you know, we have so many articles on news and current events and how they relate to Bible prophecy. And it's, it makes me really happy when I see pastors on YouTube and they're using my site as a reference point. That's one of the reasons why it exists. So, yeah. 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 So uh, we live in an interesting time in that now the end begin is a great vehicle for people to uh, stand and know and keep, keep Christians awake and let us uh, move on and be more powerful witnesses because we have that information that we can share. Amen. Yes, sir. So, um, as far as uh, what's going on today, I don't know where to begin. It's so much stuff. Um, let, let's first start off um, talking about Israel, and then we can come back to the stuff that's going on coronavirus and things like that. But Israel, what do you see as far as um, you know? Netanyahu just got um, a new government. He has kind of merged somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as far as um. Iran is concerned because that came up on Alexa yesterday. I, I don't know why Alexa started playing Iranian music, I'm but sure. um, she seems to always do stuff like that when you're around and you say the wrong words. But um, tell me what what's going on with Israel in the Middle East and the peace? Um, President Trump talking about peace agreement. Yeah, um, the deal to end no, the deal to end all deals. Because we have so many deals. <laughs> well, that's right. And everybody wants to be the person to make the, the a deal. It's like with the vaccine now. All this talk about Bill Gates and the vaccine, but there's dozens of other companies and big pharmaceutical companies in America and in Europe and in Asia. And everybody is racing to be the first one to get that done. And it's the same way with Israel. Everybody wants to be the first person to make that peace covenant. But... When you read in Isaiah 28 what that covenant really is, it's a covenant with death and with hell. And that's the Daniel 9, 27 covenant. So uh, you have to look for the key players and you always have to let the Bible be your guide. You can't, you know, you can't look at the Bible and then look at the news and try and make it fit. You, you got to look at the news and then look at the Bible and say, okay, you know, where are these things actually happening? And, and, and so we see, we see like Netanyahu uh, on Sunday, they finally signed that deal, the 35th government of Israel, and they are, um, uh, uh, they're going to split it in half. And for the first 18 months, Netanyahu is going to be the leader. And for the second 18 months, Gantz is going to be the leader. And uh, Netanyahu, absolutely, his mandate is he's going to annex about 30% of Judea and Samaria, which we call the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And already that is causing so much friction. I heard yesterday, and I haven't written about it yet, but 
Macron in France is already having secret closed door meetings. How do we stop the annexation of Judea? And why is that important? Because it says in Matthew 24, it says that, uh, and let me just pull up so I'm not misquoting, but in Matthew chapter 24, that great chapter about the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, Jesus says that uh, in verse 15, and ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So Jesus is saying that in the time of Jacob's trouble, the Jews are going to flee primarily from Judea into the red rock city of Silopetra, but they can't flee from Judea if they're not living there first, no. just like Israel had to be regathered back on May 14th, 1948, because you can't have them being scattered if they haven't been brought back to the starting place. So that's what's happening in Israel right now. And the government is only four days old and already everybody has already taken pot shots and everybody's trying to stop it because they don't want Israel to take that piece of Judea so that Matthew 24, 15 can be fulfilled. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just this morning, I did this story with the headline, Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah <clears throat> Ali Khamenei, releases poster telling Jews in Israel to uh, prepare for another final solution like the Nazi Holocaust. Now, why would Iran, their top leader, have a poster made and they call it the final solution when everybody knows that um, uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis from 1938 to 1945 put six million million Jews into the ovens and the gas chambers of the Holocaust. And yet today in 2020, we see uh, the Supreme Leader of Iran having artwork created, talking about the final solution. And this is how close we are to all these wacky, crazy things happening. So that's the real story in Israel, right? So if you were to talk to you know, like the fake news people from CNN or MSNBC, they would look at what's happening and they would want to talk about it from the perspective, oh, you have this split government and Netanyahu still might be indicted. And they would talk about all this superficial nonsense that has nothing to do with anything. But you and I, as Bible believers, we know that the real story is Judea, Samaria, and who controls Jerusalem. Because that's what the Bible says. The rest is just modern day politics. Yeah. Well, the other, we have a thing in the Bible prophecy circle. We talk about the uh, outer ring and the inner ring of mm -hmm. uh, Israel's uh, enemies. Um, how do you get rid of the, what's going to happen to get rid of the inner ring so the outer ring can come in? Well, what I mean by that is the countries closest to Israel. Is the inner ring and the outer ring is the you know, we familiar with Ezekiel 38 and 39. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Also, Psalms um, chapter 2, I believe it is, and it, and it, talk, it sounds like that somebody's, well, I know it happens throughout time, but it sounds like somebody's having a meeting and, um, you know, how they get together and our, you know, some of the Middle Eastern countries get together and just say, hey, it's time to eliminate Israel. Mm -hmm. What do you see on God's clock? Um, and I know what you're probably going to say, but as far as war is going to say, what do you see on God's clock to come next to get to uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39? Well, what's happening right now, and we have to understand when we look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, those are two separate wars. And those are wars that are fought a thousand years apart from each other. And a lot of people kind of want to merge Armageddon and Gog and Magog, but you can clearly see in Revelation chapter 19 that Jesus is mounting up for war, right? So if we turn to Revelation 19 and just look at a couple quick verses, we see very, very clearly the first thing that we see in Revelation 19 um, in verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him 
for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and that's us, and uh, we are the bride, his redeemed church, and his wife has made herself ready. And so we see the marriage of us. You know, Paul says that it, it's his heart's desire to present us to Christ as the chaste virgin, right? He's going to be walking us down the aisle, so to speak. Um, so Revelation 19 starts out with us being married to Jesus Christ. But then in verse 11, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And these are the passages that we know that he is mounting up for battle. And then verse 14, and the armies which followed him um, in in heaven upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. So here it is, and, and we get on those horses, and we come back, and we fight the battle of Armageddon, which is Ezekiel chapter 39. I'm going to do that. And then you have the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, and Satan and the false prophet are locked up for a thousand years, and then they're let out. And I didn't mean to do that. In Revelation chapter 20, and what does it so say? I have to figure and out. Verse um, 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, God and Magog. So those are the, that's the, the uh, time frame. So you have the rapture, you have the start of Jacob's trouble, which is a seven-year time period, and halfway through that period is the Great Tribulation. That leads into the Battle of Armageddon, the thousand-year reign, and then we have the Battle of Gog and Magog going into the Great White Throne Judgment. Yeah, some people say that the rapture will happen in the middle of the tribulation period or at the end. Give us a reason why you believe, um, what you believe, actually, and then the reason and why you believe that. Well, I mean, it's very, very clear. Like, for example, when you look at Matthew 24, right? There, there, it, there are no Christians listed anywhere. They are Jewish believers in a Jewish setting. They are at the temple, and they're and they're not asking about the church age or anything. They're asking about the end of the world. Well, the rapture is not the end of the world. Jacob's trouble is not the end of the world. The thousand-year reign of Christ is not the end of the world. The battle of God and Magog is not the end of the world. The great white throne judgment is not the end of the world. But, but. But then it is the end of the world. And Second Peter chapter 3, where the uh, whole thing is destroyed by fire and God remakes it after everybody is judged, everybody is rewarded, right? But when we go to Jeremiah chapter 30, for example, and we look at these passages, it says here, starting in verse 4, and these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Now, remember that phrase, because Paul is going to use it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And Jesus says it's the time of tribulation that the world has never seen. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, let me ask you this, this uh, easy question. When you got saved, what were you placed into? The kingdom, the family of God. You were placed right. You were placed into the kingdom of God, which is the spiritual kingdom, the family of God. You were placed into the body of Christ. Okay, the body of Christ has nothing to do with the nation of Israel. Nothing at all. We're not grafted into Israel. We we are grafted into the body of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we're flesh of His flesh and we're bone of His bones. No passage says that we're grafted into Israel. None of those promises that are made to, to the Jews are given to the church. You know how the national day of prayer, that all kind of one world that, you know, the Hindus praying with the atheists, praying with the Catholics and the Christians and the rabbis, right? And what verse do they constantly take? 
Second Chronicles 7, 14. And if my people, which are called by my name, shall repent, I will, you know, I will hear from heaven and I'll heal their land, right? Yeah, but when, when you go to Second Chronicles chapter 7, that's a promise God is making to King Solomon about the restoration of Israel when they fall into idol worship. It has nothing to do with America or Spain or Germany or France or Russia or any other nation but the nation of Israel. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, what does Paul say? But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, and here's the reference to Jacob's trouble, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, what part of Jacob's trouble, which is the judgment of Israel, which starts from day one. Uh, Jacob's trouble starts with three and a half years of Antichrist making a false covenant with the Jews and deceiving them into thinking that he is the Messiah when he's not. And then halfway through, he breaks that covenant. He sits down on the throne in the rebuilt temple. They realize that they've been following the wrong guy. And then Jesus says, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So, not only do we have no part in Jacob's trouble, because when we got saved, we got judged. You can't get saved unless you admit that you're a sinner, right? And you can't get saved unless you admit that you need to be saved from the consequences of your sin, which is an eternal time in hell. So right? why, why do you think people want to place themselves in the tribulation series? Well, because everybody thinks they're so tough and everybody thinks, you know, that they're a great warrior for God and when they're not. OK, and I'm not saying that I am, but I'm just simply saying that, you know, everybody talks tough about hypothetical situations. Right now, you probably know the same type of people that I know and in the crowd that we run with is there's a lot of guns and second amendment and all that stuff and i'm not yeah. against any of that stuff my dad served in world war ii and and in korea and i have a brother who's a marine and you know i come from a very patriotic family i love all the amendments right but if you think about how everybody reacted with the covid 19 lockdown and we were locked down for two solid months with very rare exceptions like michigan and I think it happened out in California, but every other state just went meekly and quietly and there were no rallies. There were, there were two or three protests, but that was it. We had 50 states and only three of them had protests, right? Yeah. So where were all the tough talking gun people then, right? I mean, I'm just simply asking a question, but it's those same type of people, that same mentality where People want to go through the tribulation because they think that they're a warrior, right? And they think that they're going to pay God back and it's God, I'm going to fight for you. And they don't realize that in order to be in the tribulation, you have to not be saved because the, the time of Jacob's trouble is a judgment. So if you're saying that you're going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble, then you're saying that you've never been judged for your sins. And if you've never been judged for your sins, you're not saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, right. so I've heard everything in the last couple of weeks, months, years. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I heard is that, and I keep hearing this often, that we're in the sixth seal and the fourth <laughs> trumpet, we're in this, we're in that. What, what is your take on that? All right. So let's just real quickly. Um, Revelation chapter four. After this, I looked and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So the first three chapters of Revelation is the opening greetings and salutations. John is figuring out what happened to him and where he is. And then immediately, Jesus addresses the church. in it's seven different dispensations. It's seven different ages. And it goes right up to the Laodicean church age with man, oh man. Uh, Joel Osteen, Paula White, Creflo Dollar, T.D. Jakes, uh, Kenneth Copeland, 
Um, I mean, you, you have heresy coming out of your ears, right? And and uh, uh, and all those phony charismatic faith healers, and you know they would slap people on the forehead and cancer be gone. Not one popped up to fight COVID nineteen. Uh, not one. Where were they? Did they suddenly get mute? Did they lose their voice? They were what happened? Exposed, slightly exposed. Yeah, slightly, slightly exposed for the crooks that they are. Um, and and uh, so so. So that's the great falling, the great falling away from Second Thessalonians chapter two. It's falling away from Bible doctrine. Um, Paul says to Timothy in first and second Timothy chapter four, uh, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that's what's missing, you know. Joel Osteen, I have this clip where he's talking about. Um, he's on CBS on the Sunday show, and they say to him, do you feel like you're cheating your followers because you don't preach on hell and other Bible doctrines? And then, amazingly, he goes and he gives a line from Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner, okay? He says, Pe people are beaten down enough by life, right? How many times have you heard him say that? That's from that movie with Kevin Costner from 1989 called Field of Dreams, where Kevin Costner is looking at his young father in the magical baseball field, and he's recounting that story later to his wife, and he said, yeah, he looks so young and strong. I only ever knew him in his old age when he was beaten down by life. And the first time I heard Joel Osteen say that, I'm thinking to myself, because I did the TV commercial for that movie with Kevin Costner, right? Um, uh, and, and I'm like, I know that line. And so Osteen is as fake as you could possibly be. Plus the rest of those fakers and, and then, you know, Kanye West and, and he makes a billion dollars, right? He's now a billionaire. He made $250 million selling his trash to gullible Christians. Right. And now where is he? Yeah. No way. Right. Right. $250 million later, right? So that's the falling away, right? And that's exactly, what's that? I'm glad you brought that up because that, that uh, fits right into uh, what we're gonna talk about next. Um, right, but just to answer your question, because I kind of got you know um, a little off the track with the falling away, but that is exactly what Jesus says with the Laodicean church age. You are rich and increased with goods. And you can't find for me one charismatic mainstream preacher who doesn't live in a house that's a minimum of 12,000 square feet, right? A minimum. That's, that's 11 times the size of the, of the place that I live in, right? Um, so that's how the end of Revelation chapter 3 goes, and then Revelation chapter 4, you have John being taken up to heaven in a type of the rapture. Revelation chapter 5, Daniel's seven-sealed book is open, right? Now the church has already been in heaven raptured for one full chapter, and then the very first seal is opened up in Revelation chapter 6. So if we're raptured before the opening of the first seal, how can we be on seal number 5, 6, or 7 right now? Well, it says um, that the six seals happen first, and then the seventh seal opens up the seven trumpets. Right, but so all there's no way there's no way it can be we can be on another. We have to be the, we have to be prior to the first seal. I mean, it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are two chapters away from the first seal. We have to get to heaven first, and then Daniel's seven sealed book has to be open. You know. Um, people don't think about it. Revelation 5 says it has seven seals, and then seven seals are opened. But John, as the type of the church, is already up in heaven watching that book being opened. How can we be down here on the earth and the seals opened and we're not raptured? It's not possible. So, what, what as far as the 21 judgments of God, um, what do you have to say to the people listening? Will be listening in the future to warn them that 
first of all, uh, as far as life and death, you, you want to be ready when, before you die. Uh, <laughs> but as, as far as these uh, 21 judgments, you, you, you speak to them and let them know the, uh, the seriousness of the hour um, mm -hmm. that we're living in. And then also, uh, I guess I should ask this question. Well, we kind of go, but are we? Uh, how far? How, how close are we to Christ's return? So you cover the first question first, and then talk about how close are we to Christ's return? Okay. First of all, the tribulation is not something that you can get ready for. Okay. Back in the 1980s, there was a boxer by the name of Mike Tyson. Okay, and you know, I mean, he's obviously still alive today. In fact, he's getting ready to fight again. Right? He's going to fight Holyfield in an exhibition round, which actually might be pretty cool. But, but um, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey that was the training camp for Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber. And he was the heavyweight champ for a long, long time. And my dad used to work in an ice cream shop in Pompton Lakes. And he would, every Tuesday, Joe Lewis would stop in and get a pint of vanilla ice cream and give all the kids quarters. And my dad was raised watching Joe Lewis train. So I love boxing, right? And when Mike Tyson started, I can remember that he was just, he was, he was terrifying just to look at. I mean, forget fighting him. Uh, he was, he was a visually terrifying person. And if you watch the Sphinx fight, um, he fought Michael Sphinx, I forget the year, but you can see the fear in Sphinx's face and he goes down like a, like yeah, a, like a rag doll almost immediately. And he has no part of it. He, he goes down, he stays down, right? He wants no part of Tyson um, because people were terrified of Mike Tyson, right? And the first 26 fights, he, 19 of those 26 fights, he knocked people out in the first 30, 60, 90 seconds, right? Now, I use that by way of example is before Mike Tyson kind of fell in, in with a bad crowd and started doing drugs and staying out late and compromising his training. He, if he would have stayed true to the course, he would have retired undefeated. He was that good, right? But when he was in his prime, you could not prepare to fight him. You couldn't do it because you couldn't beat him. He was too tough. He was too strong. He was too powerful. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, And for this cause, God shall send strong delusion that they should believe a lie, right? Now, we know that the strong delusion is that Antichrist is Jesus Christ. And that strong delusion happens immediately after the rapture, right? And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you didn't want the gospel when you could have had it, you rejected it. Now God's going to send you strong delusion. Can you imagine if all of Mike Tyson's 26 opponents were terrified to fight him because he was too strong? Can you imagine something that God says? Yes, it's pretty strong. God's saying that. How strong is that? <laughs> right? You can't prepare for the tribulation. You, and in fact, it is so overwhelming and so terrifying that unless God shortens those days, nobody gets saved. And unless he seals the 144,000 witnesses, nothing's going to happen. Everyone's going to die and everybody's going to go to hell. So there's 21 judgments. You can't prepare for any of those. 100 pound hailstones falling from heaven on fire and mixed with blood, right? What are you going to do with that? Now, you see how um, completely terrified America was when the Twin Towers fell, right? And, the, and those clips were played endlessly for years. And every time you see those clips, somebody yells and gets mad because that, with that passion comes right up. Because, because the, the destruction, watching those buildings fall, is over. It just, your emotions and your feelings are on overload. And you have smoke coming out of your head because you're... Your mind can't process what you're watching. How can both those towers... Now, look, let's forget about conspiracy theory, but let's just focus on the fact that however they came down, they came down, right? Well, 19 years later, and I watch those videos, my mind still can't process it with all those people inside, and it just flattened like a pancake. Well, that's nothing compared to the 21 judgments in Revelation. We were unprepared.
for 9-11. And as a nation, we mourned and cried and wept for years and years and years and years and years afterwards, right? And 9-11, as bad as it was, is not even one one thousandth of the judgments that, that God will send in the tribulation. And you, you cannot prepare for it. The only thing that you can do is you can get saved and you get taken out in the rapture. Because the Bible says we're not appointed unto wrath, but we are appointed unto salvation. And that's the only way that you can prepare for it is by missing it completely. Yeah. The, the strong illusion, um, do you see that as a possibility of being the rapture, names of people missing, UFOs, and, and the earth gave up its bad isms and all this? I, I hear New Age movement talks about scenarios of, especially in movies. I mean, I hate to refer to a movie, but, <laughs> but a lot of Bible prophecy movies seem to be prophetic as, as we get. As we go, I was watching this deep, uh, deep in the night, and it's it's amazing how it's like they're faking. You can see it coming too. They're they're faking the the mark of the beast, and they're mm -hmm. making you know sneaking and making technology, dressing up in costumes and mm -hmm. other stuff, stuff trying to fool the government. But as far as um, the strong delusion. Uh, do you see that as being the, uh, the government? Because uh, evidently we took we took coronavirus, and I mean I'm not, I'm not talking about conspiracy. I'm not talking about conspiracy, but some people just can look like you say you looked at the screen during 9/11, uh, and, and, and you know, and kind of look at that today, and you still like wow. Yeah, you're still getting that. <laughs> but, but as far as as far as coronavirus, I mean. I don't know. I see that as a strong illusion because people are walking around like it's, they just have, they're not even focusing in on what, what are ramifications of losing your freedoms and stuff. And then as far as like churches, I understand it says in uh, Romans chapter 14, um, talks about uh, authority and God placed authority in charge and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, to answer that question for me as far as the strong delusion, but I just opened up another question. Yeah, yeah. But, but as far as the as far as the churches is concerned, when do they say, okay, enough is enough. We we have to start. Well, when is the point where the government starts um saying you can't meet? Um so when do you draw the line? How bad does it have to get before you say, okay, I, I see what I was okay, I see what the church is doing now, and, mm -hmm. you know, and they have that right to do that. When, when you see it okay for them to start saying, okay, we're not doing what you say. Right. Well, in Acts chapter 5, we have the stories of the apostles, and you've got Peter, James, and John, and, and they are, are uh, told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, and they bring them before the council. And they read them the riot act and they have this whole big long conversation right and they say you know you were just causing a stir and an uproar we would like you to stop so they say okay great and they let them go and the very first thing they do when they let them go is they start preaching jesus again and then they bring them back before the council and they want to do all this nasty stuff to them but um Gamaliel says in acts 5 um 38 and now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if, if this counsel, if this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And look what they did. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. You see what they did? Right? They were told to stop it. They didn't stop it. They, now, they weren't, they weren't taking on the government in any way, shape, or form. There was no riots. There was no protests. There was no swords, there was no weapons, there was no staves. They just simply said, okay, we hear what you're saying. We get you. Let us go. They let them go. They go right back to doing what God told them to do. And I think Acts chapter 5 
is very, very, I mean, we should be taking our cues from that. I did a radio show last night, a, um, you know, we have a two, on Sunday nights, we have a two hour Bible study. And I talked about preparing yourselves for the coming persecution, because what's happening with the coronavirus, it's a real virus, people are really dying, but it's been hijacked by the new world order people to bring in this type of global governance and to lock people down. Um, 9-11 had the Patriot Act and, you know, 19 years later, people don't even know what it is, but it's very real. It's on the books. If the government wants to accuse you of being a terrorist, they don't have to have any proof at all. They just have to accuse you. And the Patriot Act says that they can take you to an undisclosed location. They can hold you without charges. You don't have the right to see a lawyer and they can keep you there until they feel like letting you out. Now, when you tell people that in 2020, they think you're crazy because they've forgotten that the Patriot Act was passed after 9-11, right? And people are largely, and you know, I don't, I don't want to use any negative terms, but people are uh, uh, willfully ignorant, all right? They don't want to know the truth. And um, human nature, for whatever reason, greatly resists the truth. So after 9-11, you had the Patriot Act, but what do they have now? It's the Trace Act, right? That's what's before Congress, and there, and it's a HR 060606, and like our mind boggles. It's like, did they really just call this bill in Congress, bill number 666? Yeah, they did. And that's not conspiracy theory, that's a fact. And the Trace Act has $100 billion in funding behind it. Right? So 9-11 was a setup for what's happening now. And this is a delusion. There is no question about it, but it is not the strong, the strong delusion from Second Thessalonians chapter two is the delusion that Antichrist is Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in the very first seal. Jesus opens that seal and we see the rider on the white horse. He has a crown. Right? What does the word corona mean? I don't know. Uh, it means crown. They got all kinds of things out there what it means. No, no. The word corona is a legitimate word that has nothing to do with the coronavirus. It is a Spanish word. Have you ever heard of, um, I don't drink, but there's a beer called yeah. Corona beer, right? I used to drink that. <laughs> well, years ago, I used to drink it too. But there's a crown in the logo, a little yellow golden crown, because the word corona in Spanish means crown. Yeah, yeah, that, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, well, so when you go to Revelation chapter 6, and let's just go there real quick. But when you go to Revelation chapter 6 and read just the first two verses, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown, a corona, was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay? So, whenever you see Bible prophecy being fulfilled, there is always an overlap. Okay? There is what was meeting what is and then those two things kind of go over each other just like if you're if you're standing at the seashore and you have your feet in the water up to your ankles and one wave will wash over you and as that wave retreats the second wave comes over the top of that first wave and that's how bible prophecy gets fulfilled it gets fulfilled gradually it gets filled there's like an overlap between the old dispensation and the new dispensation and that's what happened. So we are so close to the rapture. And that was one of your questions. We are so close to the rapture that we are seeing now an unsaved world preparing themselves subconsciously to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. And they think that they're doing all this great stuff. And Macron in France, who I think is the man of sin. And if your listeners want to go to nowtheendbegins.com and see why I think Emmanuel Macron is the man of sin. It's amazing. Um, but but uh, 
the whole world is jockeying for position to be in charge. Pope Francis, let me just pull this article up. Uh, I did this article two days ago. Pope Francis, he has commissioned something called, where was this? Um, the Vatican COVID-19, uh, where did that article have to be um, but, but Pope Francis had this, 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 um, he has people in place right now because he wants to be in charge of what happens in the post pandemic world. He's already setting the table to be taking over and taking control. Um, oh, here it is. Here it is. Pope Francis tells Vatican commission to prepare the future in post pandemic world. And they said that they assembled this commission to control the post-pandemic world order. That's their words, not my words, okay? Now, if you had 1.5 billion followers and you called yourself the vicar of Christ, wouldn't you think you would want to talk about Christ once in a while in a meaningful way? How come the Pope never gives more than lip service when he was... Five years ago, when he spoke before Congress, um, Pope Francis talked about climate change. Why would you want to talk about that if you are the vicar of Christ, if you're God's anointed representative, and you're and you're speaking before the ruling body of the strongest, most powerful nation on earth, and you talk about climate change? There's something really, really wrong there. Um, but, but, but that's what you see. You see all the world powers. They are jockeying to be in charge of what's coming because they know that something really, really big is coming. They know that the world order is not only changing, it has already changed, right? Yes, sir. Well, we are not looking. What do we care about that? We're waiting to get out of here. Well, that's what we tell everybody uh, as far as the church is concerned. A lot of people on Facebook are... Uh... They're, they're swearing that we're going to be here, and um, they come or really come against. Uh, that's how you know it's right. Is uh, when you see people make it burning mad about the rapture, and mm -hmm. I, you know what makes you think you know God is not going to judge. You know, I, I thought we were already. I thought He said it's finished on the cross. So mm -hmm. You know that, that's crazy, man. I, I got it pulled up. Oh, I had it pulled up on the screen. I found that article we were talking about. Let me let me ask you about. You say the Antichrist. Uh, I kind of look in order, things go in order. So um, when they when the when they talk about the ten kings coming up first, um, I think a lot of people miss that point that the ten kings come up first. And people say, "Well, it's the it's the division of the world." I, I believe that is because in, um, I think it's on Revelation seventeen it talks about the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom. Um, it's two. The Antichrist is actually starts off with one kingdom, which is smaller. Mm -hmm. right in the world it expands through the whole world to be the eighth kingdom they already have the um com um the, the the rome council of rome or something like that has the world divided up into ten right um, europe had it had it too until they start doing some things that make me kind of be blurry that it's europe um i was looking at um how the territories of the roman empire was which was Europe, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, oh, excuse me, in Northern Africa. So, um, Nikolai Kosciuszko, I think he had it on your website a long time ago, um, started a union called the Mediterranean Union. They haven't forgot that union yet. Um, mm -hmm. but people want to know uh, a clue. It, it might happen, it might not, but a clue before the rapture of the church is you might see um, Europe either divided into 10, or in, in actually say it because mm -hmm. right now we're hearsay. We, we, we're kind of guesstimating. Is Europe divided into ten? No, it's more countries. Now. So you have um, a country, a, a, a unified organization will rise up just before the Antichrist comes to the scene. It says, "Out of the ten comes this guy." Right. But when you look at the seals, the very first seal of judgment that is open is is antichrist riding on a white horse to assume power yeah okay so that comes before anything yeah. 
And Daniel 9, 26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. So we know that this is Rome, okay? Because Rome did destroy the city. And, and, and Rome was the absolute arch enemy of the Jewish people. So that's how we know there has to be a Roman connection. And um, I have an article that I did on Macron about two weeks ago, and I call it the Assyrian. And um, if, if you can get that article to your listeners, um, in that article, we, we, I mean, I put everything that I found on Macron. Uh, he has five names. Five in the Bible is the um, number of death or judgments. Jesus had five wounds when he was put up on the cross. Uh, uh, Lucifer was the fifth cherub. Uh, five is death, however you look at it. And Macron has five names. Emmanuel, John, Michel, Frederick, Macron. Emmanuel means God with us. John means the Lord is gracious. Michel means who is like God. Frederick means peaceful ruler. And Macron means short, straight, horizontal mark. Okay, and, and, and that's just to start off with. And then we did a crazy amount of research and we went back seven generations in his ancestry, right? Hundreds of years. And we found he has multiple Jewish ancestors and he has a unshakable connection to ancient Assyria. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So have your people check that article out. Um, um, I call it the Assyrian. And, uh, um, you know, he may or may not be the guy, but in terms of people that we can look at and check out now, he absolutely, I mean, there's nobody even in second place. That's how many boxes he checks. And listen to this. He said this um, when he was campaigning. He said um, that back in 2017, he went to an official celebration of Joan of Arc in the city of Orleans, where she famously exhorted soldiers to kick out the English. Now, he's at this meeting, and there's lots of people there, and he has a vision. And his vision, he said, that his destiny was to rule France like the Roman god Jupiter, and then to saddle his own white horse and lead the French people back to glory. Now, these are words from his mouth, right? Why would he say that? Well, so when you look at all these things, Antichrist has to come first. And but so when you see the ten nations, whatever Europe is doing, it's it's a foreshadow of what's going to be done because Antichrist is the unifying force. He's the one that gets them all together and says, Okay, you got off to a good start, you're all divided up into groups and clumps, and then he tells them what to do. He leads them down the path. Mm -hmm. wow. So, what um, you see um, in Matthew 24, um, you see the nations, the rise of the nations, the mm -hmm. kingdom, and the first places. And the first places. Um, those uh, are the beginning of the first things. And then in chapter 9, it says uh, you should be handed over uh, immediately. Um, I kind of divide um, Matthew 24. I think the tribulation period starts when it says and these are the beginning of the first thing. But um, so right after that, it seems like the government just comes right after um, believers. Well, we have to be prepared for that now. And that's what I was saying on my radio show last night is that um, this vaccine, whoever comes out with it first, right? It's, it's going to be on multiple levels from multiple people, and it's going to seem like it's coming from every direction, okay? I have three children, and um, uh, none of them are vaccinated. And over the years, we have had to do some fairly impressive battling with state school boards uh, because they insisted on our children being vaccinated, and we said no. And, and we prevailed. But even that is starting to, to a change. Is they're not going to allow your children to go to school unless they have been vaccinated. Um, so, but all of this, 
Bill Gates, Emmanuel Macron, the digital identification from ID 2020, all those things is part of a system that's being put into place right now. And if you focus on any one person, you're going to miss the rest of what's happening. Okay, so I was telling people on my program last night that you have to be prepared. What happens if tomorrow there's a knock on your door and it's the government? Now, didn't Trump say last week that he was going to uh, have the military to hand out these shots? Um, he was on Fox News and he said that he just came out of a meeting and they're going to have the military distribute the vaccine when it's ready. Now, why on earth would the military in America we have the world's greatest network of doctors and nurses and pharmacists and healthcare workers and healthcare providers and all those things in every single state. We don't need the military to hand out a vaccine unless it's not going to be optional. Do you and think that, do you think it's going to lead to the mark of the beast? Absolutely, but we will be taken out before that, okay? Christians will never face the mark of the beast, ever, ever, ever. John MacArthur, okay, um, he has an article, um, a sermon, where he said that if a Christian in the time of the tribulation, first of all, there will be no Christians in the time of tribulation, but even if there was, okay, um, John MacArthur said that if you take the mark of the beast, all you have to do is ask God to forgive you, and God is merciful. No, uh, God is merciful, but Revelation 14 says this, um, and the third in Revelation 14 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, or receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. Right. There's no forgiveness for taking the mark of the beast. But here you have John MacArthur, who is intentionally leading people down the wrong path and telling them that it's okay if you take the mark of the beast. What type of lunacy is that? That's insanity, okay? Look, I don't even watch horror movies, right? Because I don't want those images in my head. I don't want those sound effects in my head right so i don't even watch a scary movie the idea that that you have a a pastor in the 21st century he's saying christians can take the mark of the beast and all you have to do is ask god to forgive you that's lunacy is what that is that's amazing yeah mm -hmm. yeah that um you know kind of reminds me of when um the, Jewish people were marked. It was a kind of reverse, though. They kind of marked the enemy, but in this place, they're going to mark. Uh, they're going to mark the people who are for the government. So that's crazy. If you take mm -hmm. it. So um, as far as um, timing of the rapture, I know we, no one knows the day and hour, but how close do you think we are um, to uh, Jesus Christ's rapture in His church? Of? Well, it's funny that you say that. I was having lunch with my friend Andy a couple of months ago. This is maybe uh, seven, eight, nine weeks into all the talk about the coronavirus. Um, and we were talking about there just seems to be a lot more earthquakes and there seems to be a lot more of this, a lot more of that, and you know, wars and rumors of wars and all that stuff. So it gave me the idea to, to go back home and to go to my website and in chronological order, pull up the articles from January 1st all the way to that time, which was about two and a half months ago. So it would have been January, February, and maybe the first week of March, right around there. And I looked at every article that I wrote and without fail, starting right on January 1st, and the first story that I, the first news article that I did on January 1st, was the story of how Iran, Russia, and China were preparing to have their war games, which was unprecedented. Those three nations had never had military um, exercises. And now for the very first time in world history, on January 1st, 2020, 
the announcement was made, and then a few days later, they had the war game. But from January 1st all the way up to the day that I had lunch with my friend Andy, um, it was a, a non-stop. It was something big was happening every single day, which was not the case. You know, I started now the end begins 10, 11 years ago. Um, and it used to be, and you've been around a long time too, right? Um, it used to be, you would get like one good article about something, then it'd be like days or a week or two. And you, you would be like really searching for like, man, this is a prophecy site. I don't have much to write about. And you would kind of have to write about other things and talk about, you know, you know, stuff, but, but not now. And in 2020, it has been non-stop from January 1st to the date that I had lunch with my friend um, a couple of months ago. And then I wrote this article called um, the recent earthquake in Utah. And that was the strangest thing, right? This earthquake in Utah, it shook the grand temple for the uh, Mormons, right? And they don't want to be called Mormons now. They want to be called the, the Church of Latter-day Saints and all that stuff. But I call them Mormons, right? But it shook the Mormon temple. And on top of the Mormon temple is this golden statue of the angel Moroni, right? But now think about it. It's really, really weird, right? If you're going to put a statue on top of a public building, it has to meet certain codes. And um, the statue is holding a golden trumpet in his hand, right? So we have to assume that that, I mean, just from the wind and the rain and all that stuff, that trumpet had to be fairly secured to that statue because it could fall and hurt somebody, right? That earthquake shook the trumpet out of the statue of the angel Moroni without knocking the statue down. So did it pop the rivets? Did it break the soldering? I'm not a person who works in metal, but it's a, it was either riveted bolted or soldered there's no other way that i'm aware of that you can attach metal to metal safely so an earthquake that could break solder that could pop out bolts that could make rivets come loose why would just the trumpet fall and so i wrote this article um talking about are we now experiencing you know that beginning of sorrows, which, which, you know, I rightly divide the word, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I understand that Matthew 24 is primarily written to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But those two verses where it talks about the beginning of sorrows, I could, I could very easily apply that to what's been happening since January 1st. So to answer your question directly, I said all that to say this. I've been saved since March 14th of 1991, long time, right? Um, and I love prophecy right from the very beginning. And I used to read books like by Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast, and Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey and all that stuff. Um, and I love looking at the fulfillment and talking about like what you know we're talking about here. But never in 29 years have I seen a period of time like we've had for the last four months and three weeks now that it has been nonstop. So what does that say to me? Paul says in Titus 2.13 that we have to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We walk by faith, not by sight. Signs are for the Jews. They're not for the church in the church age. But man, oh man, are, I have never seen a time like we, that we are in right now. And every day I say to somebody, uh, and I'll say it to you today. I say it to my friends all the time uh, that I hang out with here in Florida. Um, I say it on my radio show. I am waiting for there to be one day where nothing happens. And that has not happened since January 1st of this year. And just from the 10 year perspective of now the end begins, I have had plenty of downtime, plenty of blank spots, plenty of, of you know weeks and weeks on end where nothing big prophetically is happening. There has not been one day in nearly five months where something big has not happened, not one day. So 
we are in very, very unusual times. So I am, from my own personal perspective, I am preparing to be launched on flight 777 any day now. And I, I understand everybody who's been a Christian for the last 2000 years, that's kind of been their perspective, but there is an urgency that I feel every single day that I didn't necessarily feel before. You know, it's kind of like when you're a kid and your parents say that, you know, you're going to take a weekend trip to the shore or you're going to go to Disneyland or Disney World or whatever it is, right? And there's that general sense of anticipation that you have. It's like, you know, like, wow, in six weeks, we're going to go on this great little vacation, right? But then that night before you go to bed, before the, you know, the trip is going to be the next morning. You got to get up early because everybody's got to get in the car, right? And everybody's all sleepy. But when you go to bed that night, there is a heightened sense of anticipation because you know that when you open your eyes, it's trip time. For me personally, that's where I'm at right now, that I am at the night before, and I'm going to open my eyes, and what does Paul say? Uh, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So you're not going to get the chance to prepare for it, right? So it happens so fast. Like, for example, it could happen right now while we're talking, but there's not going to be this like, oh, hey, I just got the 30 second notice. Let's warn everybody before we go. No, we're just gone like that, right? So God has put on my heart for better or for worse, whether it's my imagination or my opinion or what anybody wants to call it. But I know for me personally, being saved almost 30 years and having ministry for 10 of those 30 years, I feel now that it, it is the night before the big trip. And that's how close we are. And I have reorganized my life around that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what like this lockdown for Christians is actually a very good thing because People want answers, people want truth, and people like me and you who have ministries that we've had for years, now people are coming to us, and now they want to talk about spiritual things, and now they're concerned about their soul, and now they're concerned about what is this vaccine, what is this ID 2020, what is Bill Gates, what is all this stuff, and people like me and you, we have answers for them, right, so so um, I've already decided that it doesn't matter when the lockdown is lifted, I'm not going back to the way it was before. I'm going to continue to live in this heightened state of anticipation because I believe that it's right around the corner. And even though I've been saved for 30 years, I've always felt it was close. I have never felt that it was this close. Personal opinion, I'm not setting any dates or anything like that, but that's how close I think we are. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while, Blog Talk Radio, you name it, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, I've never seen it like this. I call it the funnel effect. I just set my wife down on the couch. I prophesied this morning. <laughs> I'm not a prophet, and I didn't do no YouTube videos. You know, some people you have a dream, and you know, and they want to put everything up on Facebook. And nothing wrong with that. I'm not mm-hmm. criticizing them, but I, I told my wife that the, you know, I talked about Syria and soon that was before Syria came on the map and then all of a sudden it started happening. I also told her whenever Jesus Christ gets ready to come back, I told her it's going to start in spring. Mm-hmm. I didn't say nothing about the winter, but whatever year it is, or two years, it might overlap the other year, but things are going to start happening in one particular spring and it's going to go into the fall. The reason why I say that, I, you might be, you might be the first three. person, I'm, I'm a fall peace person. I believe that the next thing on the God schedule is the peace trumpets, but I'm not saying it'll be an hour. But yeah. I, I do believe that um, when it does come, it'll start, it'll escalate a given year, and you're going to be able to tell that it's happening. And this is what's going on. The bird pains are increasing, the ladies dilating. You're going to, you know, now, she's gonna, now the baby's going to come out. And you can feel it worldwide. Mm-hmm. And I told mm-hmm. my wife about Matthew's 
Uh, and the reason why I keep bringing up Matthews um, because you know people say well, the rapture is not in it. But I, I don't I don't think it actually has to be. It just has to. You you got to be able to tell. Like, it goes know. around. It goes around the rapture. Yeah, it goes around the rapture. Mm -hmm. But you can feel what what where we at in that book. Mm -hmm. And um, chapters one through seven. I, I said last year to my kids, I said my kids got on me, they're young, and I said, hey, hey, this is probably going to be happening, these four or five things, you know, earthquakes, pestilences, mm -hmm. and, and they are, and they are, that's what's going on now, mm -hmm. now, so, I'm almost out of time, but, okay, you good. I was but, gonna... but I just want to touch on one thing that you just said, because I am definitely a springtime person, and spring, a lot of people in America, we associate the start of summer with Memorial Day because that's when the backyard parties and the barbecues and going to the beach and all that stuff. But but springtime doesn't end globally until June 21st. OK, so we still have another. It's May 21st. We still have another full month of spring to go. Right. Song of Solomon, chapter two and starting in verse uh, eight. The voice of my beloved, behold, he come leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, now what did the apostles ask Jesus? Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which, right? So, Song of Solomon 2.10, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter, season number one, is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers, spring, number two, appear on the earth, the time of the singing, of the birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Um, three, the fig tree, Israel, put it forth her green figs and with the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So Solomon seems to be talking about a rising up of the bride and her beloved in the springtime. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, so thank you for coming on, man. I wish we'd have did it on screen yards. We'd have been live. But, uh, it was my it was my pleasure. I always I always love talking with you. Um, and if you want to do this in like a next couple of weeks, and we can figure out how to stream it live, count me in. I would love to do. I would love to do it. All right, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. You have a blessed day, man, and I'll be praying for you, man. Thank you. Same here. Have a great day, brother. All right. All right. Bye bye.